I met Brendan in February of 1977 when the Los Angeles Times sent me to the Mass to interview him for the paper. I planned to read a short excerpt of the piece that I wrote, but when I looked for it, I realized I'd loaned it to Brendan four years ago when he was working on his mask book and I never got it back. So, Kateri, if it turns up, can I have it? <laughs> Um, a really cute picture of Brendan ran with the piece. He was standing under, under an umbrella in that filthy mask alley and he was standing under an umbrella and he kind of had a, a hapless Charlie Chaplin quality. Um, he was very impish and mischievous and I like that about him. I loved Brendan immediately because sometimes you meet a person and your heart just opens to them because you know you'll always be on their side because there's a goodness in them that you know you can trust. And Brendan was one of those people. He had kind of a beatific quality and he was very generous and you could sense that he would always be that way. He was pretty young then, and I remember being impressed by what he was pulling off. But he was very modest about it. Brendan was really humble, and he wasn't on an ego trip, and he didn't need to be the boss. He was just trying to make interesting things happen. And he did. He was essentially creating a culture and a community out of thin air. And he did it very gracefully and with a lot of humility. He was kind of Phoenix-like, too, in that he'd have a club, it would get shut down, he'd go find somewhere else to do a, a club, and he just kept moving on around the city, and he finally found a safe haven at the lingerie that lasted for a while. Um, back in the day, Brendan was pretty wild, and there was a rumor that he'd made it a goal to sleep with every punk hat on the scene. And I heard he made a pretty good dent in that list, too. But because he and I sort of had a collegial relationship, it never occurred to me that I might be on his list. And then one night he asked me to go for a drink at Steve Bordner's, which was the bar down the alley from the mask, which was long closed then. This was about 1985. And after about two drinks, he just kind of put it out there. He said, how about a friendly shag? <laughs> And I, lo I love that he put it that way. It made it seem so kind of frisky and harmless. And the first thing I said to him was, does this technique work with other women? And he was laughing to himself by then too because he knew it was ridiculous. And I said, are you kidding? And the fact that I declined his generous offer, I think played a role in the fact that we always stayed good friends. And we did stay good friends and we stayed in touch. Um, we had similar cultural interests, so I'd often run into him at performance art, music, art exhibitions, and we would have semi-regular lunches. And we settled into this routine that never changed, would never change. We'd meet and he'd say he had a story to tell me, and he'd start talking. And about 10 minutes in, I'd start losing sense of where the story was going. It would just, there would be sidebars and footnotes and, and subheadings and it just would tentacle out in a million directions. It was kind of like spilled wine on a tablecloth. His story just sort of spread. And if I interrupted him to ask a question or I had to get off the phone or excuse myself because I was on fire, he'd get very upset. And he'd say, you never let me finish my story. But Finishing a story was not in Brendan's repertoire. He was in the grip of an epic narrative that had no beginning and no end. And he could always continue it. It was Halloween, October 31st. It was a full moon. It was the night Fellini died and River Phoenix died. And, um, and I remember I performed there. I, I remember riding around on the floor in my underwear and stuff. But anyways, uh, good times. And, uh, and uh, that was the night, Kateri and Brendan, you know, they'd been together and then they separated. But this was the night both of them randomly came to this event and they reunited again on October 31st, 1993. So in a, in a way, Jean-Pierre Bocara is somewhat the catalyst for Kateri and Brendan having been together for 16 years. So Jean-Pierre Bocara. It's not easy for me to tell in a few minutes how unique and precious Brendan's friendship was to me. 
Most of us will probably praise the same qualities about him. His intelligence, his incredible knowledge of music, his avid curiosity for all forms of artistic expression, his allergy to bullshit, and his unique sense of humor. With the mask, Brandon opened a shelter to many musical outcasts and created the pivot and the crucible for a whole constellation of artists. Later at the lingerie and other venues, he continues this musical expansion, exploring performance art, cabaret, and film as well. Like few, he developed a sensitivity to our cultural environment and made a statement about it in an interesting and lasting way. Brandon was a seeker. He was interested in everything, every kinds of music, all forms of art, politics, and social trend. He would have added color to any conversation at any VIP gathering around the world. Because of my own artistic passion and work interest, I found in him a, support, in him a supporter and an inspiration as well as a friend. When I met Brendan in the early 80s, I struggled to maintain artistic integrity and effervescence with my first club. I tried to create something different and vital, and all along his support was steadfast and valuable. He could fully understand what I was doing as he had done it himself and lived it too. Most people could grasp part of the picture or enjoy the final result, but Brendan was already an insider. He knew with his sweat and his, in his bones what kind of work and joyous sacrifice it takes to create magic. He knew that the life of a real club owner is not as glamorous as it seems. It's also filled with long hours, pressure, torture, and anxiety. We shared the joys and the pain, and somehow it made it easier. Miss Luna Park and Cherry upstairs more than anything from the 90s, last of a dying breed. Luna Park was not a part of some stupid attempted chain of celeb lavatory clubs owned and operated by a consortium of faceless, nouveau monied poopheads <laughs> who all pitch in to back their coke dealer to run a silicon booty coral for them. <laughs> a place to round up droves of desperate faceless moors and the booze and dope pimps who love them, who call themselves promoters and club owners. Uh, far more influential than the New York punk rock scene, which got a lot more press. Yeah. And, and uh, the reason he, he his, his rationale was that there, it wasn't so much because of the amount of attention the bands got or the number of records they sold or the number of people that came to see their shows, because more people came to see the Ramones or Richard Hell or, or the New York kind of very important people, but that the, the generation of people that came out of the mask in the early 80s and the late 70s went on to be the movers and shakers and the people at the, at the television studios and the movie production houses and the record companies and we're the people who moved into positions of power and moved into the, having the ability to influence things because I mean if you're John Lurie you're like famous for a minute and you're just still John Lurie. But if you went on and you're like running some company and you're taking that sensibility you learned from Brendan and all that, and now actually making decisions based on something maybe you learned from him, it changes everybody's perception. Introducing Danny Cohen. Danny Cohen, who's going to sing The Basement. I remember you, my old friend. Will I follow you like a trend? into the blue is Wendy where you go Harvest 